Where can you get them? We're getting a lot better uptake in pharmacies. You can get them at all Intermountain Healthcare pharmacies without a prescription, university pharmacies, several chain pharmacies, the VA. In Salt Lake, we do have a pharmacy where we have our free kits. I'm certainly open if there's a community pharmacy down here that wants to do that. I'd love to stock them with free kits so that people don't have to worry if they don't have the resources. Several food chains, including Associated Foods, CVS, have the kits available without a prescription. But the problem is getting people into the pharmacies. So I've been talking about this, you can imagine, I've been talking about this at Primary Children's like crazy. And from July 2015, in the time period, we've gotten about 5,000 kits out into the community. And I've tried to get every doc that had an overdose, every family that has opiates in the home to prescribe it. How many prescriptions do you think went out? So 18 months out of that pharmacy. 50. Nine of them were to me because I like to test what the co-pays are. So getting them in pharmacies is not enough. Like people are not necessarily just going to walk into a pharmacy and say, hey, by the way, I'm a heroin user. Can you set me up with this? Or by the way, I'm worried about my grandma who is using medications more than I think she should be. It, it, we have to find other ways to get these kits into people's hands. Um, I, I mentioned most of this. Here's the cost range. Most insurance plans do cover them, and we will always have free kits available. So when are you going to use these kits? So the key is recognizing an opiate overdose. Has anyone ever seen one? I know you all have back there, but I, I, anyone, any of you community members ever seen somebody overdose? It, once you see it, you won't forget it. They uh, look like they are trying to die, and in fact, they are. Um, they have a couple of very recognizable signs, and I think this is a good time to say it's never appropriate to give naloxone to somebody who's not overdosed. So one time I heard of a scenario where a mom got a kit, and she said, I can't wait to go home and give this to my kid when he comes home all high tonight. That's not what naloxone is about. It's about saving a life. And your only liability protected by the law is for good faith administration. So going around and just poking people because you felt like it, not gonna be okay. It's good faith, you really thought somebody was overdosed. So here's the signs. Two general overall signs. They're not responding to you. They're not talking to you, they're not moving. So someone once said to me in one of these trainings, well, what if they tell me they really don't want it? They're really not overdosed. If they can argue with you, if they can talk you out of it, if they can run away from you, they're not overdosed. So not moving, not talking. Those are two kind of systemic. And then go top down. Pinpoint pupils, itty bitty tiny pupils. We've all done this since we're kids, right? Big little, big little. They don't do that. They're tiny little flecks of pepper. Not much in else in medicine does that. If you see that, you can feel pretty comfortable that you're dealing with an opiate overdose. Go down a little further, they're not getting oxygen. They're getting blue, they're getting purple. Nails, nail beds, lips are the first place you'll see that. People are darker skin tend to look more gray than blue. And then finally, breathing. Remember I told you overdose causes you not to breathe well. So slow breathing equals, that's a sign of overdose. Do you have to have all of those to be overdosed? Nope, not like a checklist, you have to have A, B, C, D, E to be overdosed. But those are the signs you're looking for. Another kind of a look at way to remind it. So just think of those two kind of systemic. They're not responding, they're not moving, they're not talking. Go down the body. Pupils are tiny, lips are bluish, breathing's weird. I've done this for a ton of years in the ER. I've used naloxone hundreds of times. I came across somebody downtown in Salt Lake and I was scared. Like it was a different world for me. I knew what it was, but I was scared. What if I'm doing the wrong thing? What if she's had a stroke? What if it's her diabetes? Look for those signs, trust your gut. If you think that's what it is and you see those signs, you're never gonna hurt them if that's not what it is. And you're potentially really gonna help them if it is that. So deciding to use it, you see someone, you suspect an overdose based on those symptoms or based on what you know on their history or based on what somebody tells you. The woman I saw that people said, she's overdosed, she shot up and she overdosed. So you suspect an overdose, you call 911, you check, are they gonna to respond to you? We call it a sternal rub. You take your knuckles and you rub it on their sternum. It's annoying, it'll make people bat. You can rub on their upper lip, pinch the kind of crunchy part of their ear, things that will make them respond if they're able to. If they're not responding to you, look at their breathing status. So remember what I told you about, it's a respiratory depressant? So if someone's hyperventilating, <laughs> you think that's probably an overdose of opiates? Probably not. Could it be an overdose of more than one thing? Yeah, maybe. So I still tell people, if you see those tiny pinpoint pupils and someone not responding, give them the naloxone. That middle where somebody's slow breathing, so what's slow breathing? We're probably all breathing around 12, maybe 20 times a minute. 
When people are slow, 10, less than 10 times a minute, that's a breath every six seconds, so. You're looking at me thinking, take a breath. That's what you're looking at somebody too. Take a breath, they're not breathing. Or none, no breathing at all, gasping. Sometimes people will get into this awful, um, death rattle is one of the terms that's used. It's kind of this, I know that's really attractive. Don't feel free to use that one at home. But um, if you hear that, that can be, that's just really ineffective breathing. And I tell all kinds of parents, especially that are worried about kids, there have been terrible stories of people who their loved one doesn't wake up the next day and they say, gosh, I just thought they were snoring. They were breathing weird last night. And I just thought they were snoring. I didn't want to bug them. Well, unfortunately, it wasn't they were snoring. It's that their breathing was stopping. And so I tell families, if you hear weird breathing, wake them up or try to wake them up. If they're snoring, they'll be mad at you, but they'll go back to sleep. If they don't wake up, you really caught an opportunity to save their lives. So it's that simple. You suspect an overdose, you call 911, you try to wake them up, and then you give them the naloxone. Now we've known about CPR and rescue breathing, all of us, don't forget those. And especially if this is a loved one, give some breathing to them. Don't forget these tools that we traditionally had. When I was downtown, did I use rescue breathing? No. That's okay. Don't ever tell yourself, I'm not gonna respond and help this person because I don't wanna do rescue breathing. Do what you can, do what you have. Naloxone is definitely one of the things you can have. So this nasal spray device, uh, we talk about this a lot with law enforcement. This is what the, hair, the um, health departments are, are trying to equip people with. It's as simple as I said, you peel it out, you place it in the nose, don't um, prime it. So you know, hairspray, Windex, we all kind of do a few before we use it. Don't try to do that with this. It'll actually launch. I learned that the hard way in the poor department of health director's face, Dr. Minor. It was just saline, but it will go. Don't try to prime it. So I tell folks, hold it on the side, put it up in the nose, and then push that if this is a, a, a dose you become equipped with. For the intramuscular kit, again, it's that single dose. And, and we have instructions with all of them. You can take a kit today, you flip it upside down, it's the amount in there. You pull it up into a syringe. Don't worry about bubbles. It's not gonna hurt somebody if there's bubbles in there. Arm, thigh, butt. Folks ask me all the time, what do you think is the best form? I truly believe the best form is the form that you have. So uh, I personally like this because I like seeing the medicine and I like seeing it go into somebody. There was a report, actually I think from, from Spanish Fork down here where they got on scene and they, the machine said there's no medicine in it. So I like seeing medicine, medicine, medicine. Similarly with this, you see it, you know it went in. So everyone figure out what their best form is, their best bias, but that's just my comfort zone. Um, you can go through clothing with the injectables. If somebody's down, it takes a whole lot to move them. Can go through a coat, can go through some pants, probably not through a leather coat or an iPhone or a wallet, so you don't want to hit one of those, but it can go through clothing. Um, and it's again, shoulder, thigh, buttocks. Never want to poke somebody in the heart. So finally, additional considerations. Uh, you sometimes have to give a second dose. We say, give that first dose, wait three to five minutes. EMS may be there by the time that three to five minutes has come up, they may not. Give them the second dose. You may actually have them alert and breathing by the time EMS gets there. As they do begin to awaken, sometimes they feel lousy, aggressive, angry, upset. Be prepared for that. Now these doses are small. They're 0.4 milligram doses. They're not as big as, as some of the other doses. And that's by design. If you have mom waking up the kid, you wanna only just get them breathing again. You don't want to bring them up swinging and hostile. You want them to be at just breathing and let not the professionals take over. Um, we also tell people call 911 before you give naloxone because folks will try to talk you out of calling 911 once they're awake for a lot of different reasons, whether it's legal considerations, um, embarrassment, shame. Don't put that on yourself. You're not the medical professional. Don't put that on yourself. CPR, again, you're never gonna hurt somebody if you give them naloxone and it wasn't an overdose of opiates. And then finally, storage. It's like most of us at like San Diego. 60 to 80 degree weather. Don't expose it to direct light. These are expired, that's why we've got them out. Uh -huh. How long do they last if you're having them in your storage? Yeah, so if you're lucky, you get about 18 months to two years when you get one. I think the kits we have tonight are around 14 to 18 months. Um, but there are good studies that show if you have an expired one, it's still viable. I encourage people, if you have an expired one, obviously replace it, call us, we'll help you replace it. But if all you had was an expired kit, still call 911 and use it. 
So who do we need to get these kits to? We gotta get it to people we know have a history of substance abuse, to people we know have high dose opioids prescribed. We get called from people who have up to, we had a guy at 360 milligrams of morphine a day, that's his dosing. We know these are risky substances and that's a ton of it. People who have a history of psychiatric illness, those who have benzodiazepines, those are nerve pills and opiates. In this realm, it's not one plus one equals two, it's one plus one equals 14 plus, yeah. What do you consider a high dose? For me, I think over 90 mil morphine equivalent units is one that I would consider. Um, so depending on uh, what your medicine is, there's a different morphine equivalent level. The CDC also recommends at about 90. Um, a lot of pain clinics are using anywhere between 90 and 150, uh, just depending on what they choose for those. And, and we, we do hear a lot too about, especially with, with elderly patients, and even, you know, I lose my car keys, I'm pretty sure you said that, so if I in my pocket, I would have left them here if I wouldn't have found them, but where people will wake up at 8 a.m., take their dose, wake up at 9.30, not remember if they took their dose, take a second dose and accident, accidentally double dose themselves, and that is absolutely a situation where that could happen. Or maybe they had a glass of wine with dinner, or maybe they were taking cold medications, right? All of those things change the chemistry, and so even though you're taking them as you think is just exactly as prescribed, those things can all change um, depending on the circumstances. Yeah. People you know have overdosed before, people that are currently in an ER, people who have other medical problems. You know, the sicker you are, the more likely you are to be fallible or susceptible. Uh -huh. When you said cold medications, are you talking you know, any of those cold medications, you know, unfortunately we'll hear about these um, unfortunate people passing when they increase meds they are not used to taking with them. So I tend to think a little bit more of a kind of more depressant type, so Benadryls, diphenhydramines that are in there. But truly adding any new medication can change the way your body's gonna process it, change the way your liver's gonna break it down, change your, your likelihood or possibility of overdosing. Mm -hmm. I was referring to oh yeah, yeah, pseudoephedrine. That's a little bit more of a stimulant, but again, I tend to think adding any new medicine to an opiate makes it riskier, makes it riskier. Um, veterans, again, number one in the nation. And this last one is a big one. After people have had a period of sobriety, so if you go 72 hours, three days without opiates, and you've been on them long term, so whether that's heroin or pain pills, and you go back to the dose you were on before, you will overdose. So this is sometimes people that maybe are thrown in jail for a weekend, or someone that goes in the hospital for a hospitalization and a surgery for three days, a mom that has a baby. These are people who have gone without their opiates for as little as three days. They absolutely need to have naloxone around because when they go back, they're really at risk. And these are people, people who've been in long-term sobriety, who have a misstep in use again, and then overdose, and then make it, and you'll hear them say the next day, I can't believe I did that, I'm right back on my path again. That was a misstep. They didn't have to die for that misstep. These are all people we should be thinking about equipping. We're working with physicians and pharmacists and public health teams and substance abuse community and law enforcement. We're literally working with anyone. And anyone that you think you'd like us to reach out to, please let us know. So the bottom line, naloxone's effective, it's safe, it's legal for you to administer, and these lives do matter. I know the frustrations that many people feel in this arena. I know the frustrations I felt with my brother. I know the frustrations that we feel in the ER on a patient that you've seen over and over again, that law enforcement gets called on, that family members are frustrated with, I get it. But there's not a day that goes by I don't miss my brother, and I know that there are plenty of other people that feel the same way. We're all good enough to save a life, and really, we have the ability. In the first 19 months, the state of Utah, we've gotten 5,000 naloxone kits out free. Uh, 236 lives have been saved via overdose reversals, and this is as of yesterday. These are reported by parents and spouses and friends and law enforcement and strangers and security officers. These are kids up camping in the Uintas 30 minutes from cell phone. This is a guy who saves his grandma. I mean, th these are everything you can imagine, every possible scenario you can imagine. 16 law enforcement agencies have been equipped. Two of those agencies have lives saved within 24 hours. Spanish Fork has saved 10 lives, literally more than anyone else in the state with naloxone. 33 law enforcement saves in the first eight months. Trainings just like this in over 100 settings, hoping to get more people thinking about it, and launched a statewide awareness and campaign of billboards. I don't know if you've seen these billboards at all. Um, that's us, that's my brother. You've now met my brother, Andy. Um, and, and the result has been people like Mitch. Mitch was in the video, you heard him talking. He put this on our Facebook, gave us permission to use it. 
said, I've been saved by naloxone multiple times. People worry it enables people to keep using. Well, it enabled me to keep living. I've been clean six months off heroin. Now I believe it's more like 14 months, isn't 14 it? Or yeah, 14 or 15 months. And so the goal with this is that we have more Mitches and less Andes because we really don't have to lose these people. Mm -hmm.